Today we're going to be talking about biotechnology, specifically transformation, which I will um, tell you about a little bit more um, further in this lecture. So Brave New World, the future of biotechnology, so the creating and discovering and manipulating of DNA. So we can look at forensics, the ability of bacteria to cre create and make human insulin, um, the addition of vitamin A into rice, also being able to send in your DNA to find out where your ancestors originated from, as well as adding the glow gene in two parts of pig and the rat. So these are just some of examples of creating and manipulating of DNA in different ways. So the human genome has about 32 billion base pairs, and these base pairs are tightly bound up in our 23 sex chromosomes. Biotechnology is genetic engineering, so it's the manipulation of our DNA. But if we're going to manipulate our DNA and engineer it, we need a set of tools. So that's what we're going to look at specifically today. Um, this unit is a survey of of those tools and our toolkit. So a little review of bacteria. We know that bacteria is a single cell prokaryote. It divides by binary fission and generations can regenerate about every 20 minutes. They can grow relatively quickly and they can also be incredibly diverse. Bacteri the bacterial genome, it's a single circular chromosome. Um, it's haploid, so it means there's only one chromosome, not a pair. It's naked DNA, so it's not wrapped around histone proteins like eukaryotes. And it has about 4 million base pairs and about 4,300 genes. Um, in comparison, it's about 1 1,000th of the DNA. In, it only has about 1 1,000th of the DNA as eukaryotes. So how have they gotten so diverse? Um, they've been able to get very diverse based on sharing and transferring their DNA, which is what we're going to talk about. They're able to do this sharing of their DNA by a concept called transformation. So these rats on the right, uh, there was an exper experiment by a scientist named Griffith. He looked at um, bacteria. He, he killed the bacteria and added in the non-pathogenic bacteria. And in doing so, uh, the mouse still died. If you, he had just added the he killed bacteria, nothing would have happened to the mouse. Um, so this showed the idea of transformation. So bacteria is opportunistic. And it'll pick up naked foreign DNA. So it'll pick up the free-floating DNA. Um, wherever it may be hanging out. So even if a bacteria dies, it'll leave behind some of its DNA and another bacteria present in the area can actually acquire the free-floating DNA. They're able to do this because they have surface transport proteins that are specialized for uptaking this uh, naked DNA. The, it imports the bits of the chromosome from other bacteria and will incorporate the bits into its very own chromosome. So when it expresses its new genes, it's called transformation. So it forms a recombination of its original DNA with the new DNA that it has uh, acquired. So plasmids, they're small supplemental circles of DNA within the prokaryote. They're about 5,000 to 20,000 base pairs, and they're self-replicating. They carry extra genes, anywhere from 2 to 30, and they have the genes for antibiotic resistance. They can exchange between bacteria, so this is bacterial sex in a sense. It's not like eukaryotic sex, but they can share information this way through these um, plasmids. And this accounts and allows for their rapid evolution, so it allows for them to change even though they're a single-celled organism. Um, it can be imported from the environment, so they can easy, easily relate and adapt to their environment. 
So how can plasmids help us? It's a way to get genes into bacteria easily. So you can insert new genes into a plasmid, and inserting plasmid into bacteria is called a vector. Bacteria now expresses a new gene, and bacteria will make new protein. So here's a little diagram of how this works. You can cut the DNA, the plasmid DNA, and you can cut the gene out from another organism that you want to add in. Then when you put the plasmid and the gene from the other organism together, you've created a vector or your recombinant plasmid. You have to glue the DNA together to keep the other gene in there. Um, and now you have a transformed bacteria. This bacteria with the new vector is now going to be able to multiply and reproduce whatever gene um, was added from the, new, from the organism into the bacteria. So here we go again. Plasmids are used to insert new genes into bacteria. So we find the gene we want in whatever species or organism we want. We cut it out and add it into the cut plasmid of the bacteria. Then we insert it and glue it in. So what are some examples? There's insulin, there's human growth hormone, and lactase, which we use to break down lactose. So we cut the DNA, cut the plasmid, and insert and glue it together using ligase. And now we've formed our recombinant plasmid. Cut DNA, DNA scissors, um, that's what we're going to talk about next. So we, I t mentioned ligase, which is going to glue it back together, but we need to figure out how we're going to be able to cut the DNA to get the genes we want. So how do we cut DNA? We use something called restriction enzymes, also known as restriction endonuclease. endonuclease. So endonuclease meaning inside the nucleus. Um, this was discovered in the 1960s. It evolved in bacteria to cut out foreign DNA. So it was a restrict, it was to restrict the action of an attacking organism. Um, and protection against viruses and other bacteria. Bacteria protect their own DNA by methylation and by not using the base sequence recognized by the enzymes in their own DNA. So what do you notice about these phrases? We've got radar, race car, madam, I am Adam, Abel was I er, I saw Abella, a man, a plan, a canal, Panama. Was it a bar or a bat I saw? Go hang a salami. I am, I am a lasagna hog. These are all palindromes, so they read the same as they forward as they would backward. So restriction enzyme. The action of the enzyme is to cut the DNA at a specific sequence. Um, so here we're going to be cutting the restriction enzyme where you see the GAAPTC and obviously the complementary strand on the bottom. So this spot or site for the, <clears throat> for the restriction enzyme to cut is called the restriction site. So there's a symmetric palindrome. We know that DNA is complementary, so we're going to know that this strand is going to complement one another, and it's going to be a palindrome. So when we cut it, we cut it at the same site, and we produce protruding ends, which are also known as sticky ends. Um, these sticky ends will bind to any complementary DNA, so this will allow for it like a puzzle piece to fit into another area. So there's more than one enzyme that we can use um, to cut. 
the enzymes were named after the organisms they were found in. So you've got the ECO-RI, you've got the HIN3, you've got the BAM-H1, and the SMA-1. These gentlemen above discovered the restriction enzymes, and like I said, the restriction enzymes are named for the organisms they, um, they came from. So the ECO-R1 is the first restriction enzyme found in E. coli, and this is just an example of the cutting of the DNA at the restriction site. So restriction enzymes cut DNA at a specific site, and it leaves sticky ends. So here's the restriction enzyme cutting site and the complementary site. And now you have your cut DNA with your little sticky ends, which are almost like puzzle pieces. So sticky ends, um, when you cut other DNAs with the same enzyme, you're going to leave sticky ends on both. So they're going to fit into each other, like I said, like puzzle pieces. And you can glue them together at the sticky ends. So you get the gene you want. Then you, the chromosome you want to add it to. And then you can combine the two sticky ends because they'll fit um, complementary to one another if we use the same restriction enzyme. So sticky ends help glue the, the genes together. So we're cutting out the gene we want. We've isolated and left sticky ends. Then we're cutting the chromosome of the bacteria we want to insert the gene in. And then we add the gene. And we bind it together using ligase. And now you've formed recombinant DNA molecule. So why mix genes together? Genes produce proteins in different organisms or different individuals. So human insulin gene and bacteria, although it's a human insulin gene in bacteria, it will still produce the same protein. So although it came from bacteria, it still has the same genes and proteins to result in the human insulin. So how can bacteria read human DNA? Well, of course, we have the universal code. Since all living organisms use the same DNA, we use the same code book. So they read genes the same way. So regardless if it's in the human or if it's in bacteria, we all still have our A's, C's, T's, and G's that our <coughs> codons are going to code for the same amino acids and result in the same protein and result in the same trait. And in the case of the bacteria and the humulin, you're going to produce human insulin. So read and copy DNA. Transformation is you insert recombinant plasmid into bacteria. You grow recombinant plasmid in agricultures. The bacteria makes a lot of copies of the plasmids um, or clones of the plasmids and the production of many copies of the inserted gene. The production of the new protein is the transformed phenotype. So you alter the DNA, you're altering the protein. So if we think about going from gene to protein, by altering the DNA or altering the gene, you're altering the protein, which is going to result in a different phenotype. So grow bacteria and make more. So we cut the plasmid, just a little review, cut the plasmid, we cut the gene from another organism, we insert the gene into the plasmid, forming a recombinant plasmid or a vector. Um, you can call it either or, you're creating a vector. So a plasmid with um, another gene or a recombinant plasmid, it can also be called a vector and then you have a transformed bacteria. Then the bacteria will grow, and then you can purify and harvest the human or the human insulin.
So uses of genetic engineering, you can genetically modify organisms, which is something we've already talked about. Um, we're going to enable plants to produce new proteins, which we've mentioned. <clears throat> so there's, so you can protect crops from insects. So Bt corn produces a bacterial toxin that kills borers, which are caterpillar pests on corn. Or you can extend the growing season of fish berries. So strawberries with an the antifreeze gene from flounder. Flounder is a fish that um, lives in the Arctic. So now you don't just have strawberries that grow seasonally. You have grow you can grow strawberries all year long with in freezing temperatures, and you never have to worry about them freezing because they have an antifreeze gene that they got from flounder. You can also improve the quality of food. So you have rice, and then you have golden rice, which is the addition of vitamin A. So there's more nutritional value. You get a more nutritional value into certain foods. So green with envy. Jellyfish have something called the glow gene, or the glow fluorescent protein. And if you isolate it out, you can insert that and transform and have transformed vertebrates. You have the glow gene in the rat, and you have the glow gene in the nose and in the both or paws of the pig. And the bunny. Cut, paste, copy, find. So we can use an analogy of word processing or a metaphor um, to think about transformation. So to cut a gene, you use your restriction enzymes. To paste the gene in, you use ligase. Um, in copying, we're looking at plasmids and bacterial transformation. Is there an easy way? Mm, not yet. They're still working and doing research and evolving. And what have we found? Um, we found that we can insert genes into bacteria as of yet. The bacterial transformation is kind is the current research at this point, and it's still growing and developing as of yet. So I'm a very special pig. Feel free to bring your questions to class, and we will talk about this on Monday.